okay so we are now up for a discussion a presentation uh, by uh, scott stroud who is uh, working as an associate professor communication studies at university of texas at austin and he is the author of a book titled as john dewey and the artful life artful life pragmatism aesthetics and morality which was published in 2011 but this is his uh, uh, a sort of a bio available on the internet which anybody can pick up but i am going to talk about the personal things about uh, scott scott uh, is a very uh, fine philosopher who has who has not only dabbled in the western philosophy but also in the eastern philosophy and he has studied uh, some aspects of the jain philosophy and also the buddhist philosophy and he has written a number of books commenting on various textual aspects of the indic texts his interest also has turned to uh, what we can say uh, the great pragmatist john dewey and also baba saheb ambedkar so from last uh, many years he has been trying to study the aspects of dewey in dr baba saheb ambedkar uh, he has been doing very intense sort of a field work is uh, sort of a is his hunting lot of leads which he has got some little hints here and there and one of his uh, scholarly pursuit is to follow through those kind of links which are available there so he has uh, browsed through many books in the siddhat library and he has gone through the private collections wherever he came to uh, know that you know such a such and such person has a hold of ambedkar literature he will he will immediately rush to that so he is doing a very wonderful and a very unique uh, sort of sort of a field work you we can say even the book work because you know he is he is looking at the books he is opening them up and then he is trying to look at uh, all different styles of uh, studies that baba saheb ambedkar has done what kind of a pencil colors he has used what kind of a notes he has put up in the margins how many editions he had and you know how his uh, you know the reading changed from edition to edition so it's a very very unique work that uh, uh, scott has undertaken and um, uh, that makes him uh, so his scholarship is not just now focused on john dewey and uh, connection with baba saheb ambedkar but also he is now exploring the host of other influences on baba saheb ambedkar you know following the leads from the books and then you know it's like a hypertext one one thing leads to another so like like we can say that he is now caught up in a maze of ambedkariana dewey and studies and a host of other philosophers he is producing wonderful wonderful papers on these aspects one of uh, he is a professor of rhetoric and you know he has been uh, this thing so he has a, a, a kind of um, what one can say uh, an approach to communicating the ideas and he is also uh, very active in mobilizing scholars students as to how the contemporary issues can be put forth how they can be framed and how they can be put across the different audiences so he is he is he is involved in a lot of works and whenever he comes to india he finds uh, his time to meet up people to keep up uh, with the academicians here and the activists alike one of the things uh, that uh, scott has contributed is setting up the first center of duian studies in india so along with his friend dr vijay khare and dr uh, scott strau they have set up a very unique center in uh, in in the pune university and uh, he was instrumental in carrying actually physically carrying the volumes of uh, john dewey which is like a huge a bulk of literature which he could how I, you know how you know, only uh, he knows how he managed to bring those all books to india and uh, you know he we brought it on his uh, person in the sense that you know he didn't cargo it or he shipped just ship it up so uh, here is a uh, scott a very good friend very dear friend and he is going to talk about this very important topic democratic potential of buddhism through baba saheb ambedkar and with john dewey so which without taking much time i request my dear friend scott to please begin his presentation tonight Well, thank you, Mangesh, and thank you for having me. Uh, all, you know, on Dr. Embedkar's caravan, this is wonderful. And uh, these Zoom series you have, Facebook Live series, it's a wonderful way to get word about out about the one the complex thought of Dr. Embedkar. That's one thing I'm constantly uh, impressed by is how many stories 
all of the different scholars that come to the work, the person, the history, the activism of Dr. Ambedkar, how many stories these folks can spin out. And every one of them is wonderful. So th this is really a sign of a great thinker is that you're not simple. And Dr. Ambedkar is not simple. He's very complex. He changes over his lifetime, his writing span, all these different subjects. And so he, no one person, no one book, no one career can exhaust what Dr. Ambedkar has to give us. The thing I think I could contribute to the spectrum of wonderful readings of Dr. Ambedkar is the kind of relationship he has with this American philosopher that I've dedicated years to studying. That is John Dewey. Now, uh, so today I'm going to talk to you know, everyone uh, that's listening out there about the relationship between Dr. Ambedkar and John Dewey, his teacher at Columbia University. But, uh, you know, nothing I say precludes other people from talking about other influences or precludes people from talking about uses Dr. Ambedkar's philosophy can have in the fight against caste oppression. So, so again, I'm going to dive into some of the historical aspects that lie behind and within Ambedkar's texts. Uh, and, you know, maybe this will open up new ways of seeing ways he can be useful, ways his thought can be useful. So I'm trying to tell the story of Dr. Ambedkar and Dr. Dewey. And in doing so, I'm also preaching the gospel of Dr. Ambedkar to my fellow uh, academics in America, because really what this is, you know, this is how I understand it, uh, Dr. Ambedkar represents the primary pragmatist in the American tradition of pragmatist philosophy in India. So when I tell the story of the influence and relationship of Dewey and Ambedkar, I'm really telling the story, an unfinished one, of pragmatism in India. Many have told about pragmatism in China, but no, not many folks have gone into details about pragmatism in India. So, so the talk today, uh, hopefully will be entertaining. Hopefully I'll have some nice pictures, but uh, you know, I'm gonna start to flesh out this relationship between these two uh, intellectual giants. Now, you know, when I started reading Dr. Ambedkar's works, uh, you know, I, I saw some of the things that many folks have mentioned in their wonderful books, wonderful articles. That is that he seemed to love his teacher, John Dewey. So for instance, in a letter to his wife, wife Savita in 1952, right when Ambedkar was going to the Columbia University in New York to receive his honorary doctorate, uh, his teacher Dewey died. And so he writes his wife and says, I was looking forward to meeting Professor Dewey again, but he died on the 2nd of June when his and Bedkar's plane was in Rome. He was so sorry, and he says this line, I owe all my intellectual life to him. He was a wonderful man. Now, Ambedkar was a straight talker. You know, he didn't, he didn't exaggerate things if, uh, you know, he was to be held accountable for these exaggerations. So, so for him to tell uh, in personal correspondence something like this, uh, you know, I, it, it caught my interest. What exactly did he owe to Dewey? What did he mean that Dewey had such an impact on his intellectual life. Because you will find Ambedkar saying this kind of uh, debt rhetoric or this kind of intellectual influence rhetoric about any, no one else. You know, he doesn't, you don't find a letter where he says, Seligman, I owe all my intellectual life to Seligman. So uh, at any rate, you know, this kind of caught my interest. And in, in the Annihilation of Caste from 1936, you see this line where he, it's one of the spots where he explicitly quotes John Dewey. You know, he says, who is my teacher and to whom I owe so much. So. The question I'm kind of animated by is how can, deep can we go in fleshing out the relationship between John Dewey and Bimrao and Bedkar? Everyone has a paragraph in their biographical accounts on the relationship. Some folks have articles on this, but you know, my current project, which is a book length manuscript, is trying to figure out how exhaustively can we categorize the historical or the conceptual relationship between these two wonderful thinkers. So, uh, you know, to put it simply, the questions I'm asking are, uh, at least today, what does Embedkar use from Dewey's thought to construct his novel concept of social democracy? And then the religious aspect, what unique role does Buddhism as a religion or a philosophical uh, point of view play in this notion of democracy? So this, this, these kind of questions have driven me all over India, driven me all over the US. Uh, exotic places like Carbondale, Illinois, or New York. Uh, but, you know, I'm, I'm in search of archival resources, whether they're notes, notebooks, books with annotations, or just books that show that he had access to this person's thought. So I've been driven all over India, all over America, trying to find any way we can get access to this period of education that we know was so influential, but no one has many details. 
of what Embedkar learned in these classes, what he found is valuable, what he wrote off from the, these teachers or their classes. And along the way, I've met so many wonderful friends in India, uh, you know, such as Mangesh, who have been so supportive in show, you know, get, helping me get access to these resources, helping me understand the context of Embedkar in the current Dalit uh, movement, and also just understanding India a wonderfully diverse place uh, that's much like America. It has all the problems of democracy and all of the promise of democracy. So let's go to pragmatism and let's return to America. A lot of you might be asking, different levels of familiarity with pragmatism exist, of course, but a lot of folks may ask, what is pragmatism? Well, one way to think about pragmatism is it's a fairly distinctive American way of thought that originates after the American Civil War primarily with thinkers like Charles Sanders Pierce, uh, William James, and John Dewey. And then it spreads out. It includes figures like Jane Addams. It includes Italian philosophers. It includes British philosophers. And so, so pragmatism is kind of a, a body of thought that originates in America, and that has resonances historically uh, across the world. And like I said before, part of my, one of my, you know, kind of sub goals in this project is to tell the story of pragmatism in India, because no one has really explored this, yet it's there, it's there. So who is John Dewey? We focus our, you know, exposure here a little bit closer. Uh, I, I'm not, there are stories I could tell you about William James and Embedkar. Embedkar owned about five books by William James, some of which Embedkar underlined and cared enough to kind of note some important points. Uh, but, but John Dewey is the philosopher that he was in the classroom with, that he quotes, that he referred to in that wonderful 1952 letter. So who is John Dewey? Well, this is an, you know, a very difficult question. One way I like to put it is, uh, you know, Embedkar once stated his three gurus. Uh, well, you can think of Dewey's gurus. He stated them in a different terminology, but he said that he owes most of his intellectual life to Hegel, the idealist, and Charles Darwin, the naturalist, the person that put evolution on the map. So, so think about Dewey's philosophy as this intriguing combination of Hegelian idealism, especially in Dewey's early years, and Darwinian naturalism that kind of continued throughout Dewey's life, but became even more prominent after 1904. So this is one thing I constantly face, uh, and I, I think you know, I tell my audiences to you know, consider this as well. There should always be a touch of skepticism when someone says, ah, and Bedkar's philosophy is like Dewey's philosophy, and they bring them together. Well, you know, think about it. Dewey wrote over 8 million words, and Bedkar wrote something similar in the 20-some volumes, volumes of English writings that have been collected. Uh, so, so these thinkers are incredibly diverse, and they change over time. Dewey in the 1880s is different from Dewey in the 1940s. And Bedkar's thought evolves and is altered by the rhetorical situations. He's talking to this audience, he emphasizes something in a certain way differently than when he talks to another audience. So, so you know, all these things have an air of artificiality to them when you construct kind of a theoretical apparatus out of someone as rich as Dewey, someone as rich as Embedkar. Things become even more complex, right, when we start trying to track the historical influence between these two. Because when you say Embedkar was influenced by Dewey, what part of Dewey? What part of those 8 million words or the countless other words that Dewey spoke in his classroom or around the halls of Columbia University that Embedkar might have heard? Because Embedkar didn't read all these books. Embedkar didn't own all these books. Nearest I can figure, Embedkar owned about 20 to 30 books by Dewey or about Dewey. I, th I judge them to be uh, among the surviving books Embedkar uh, has in his archives, uh, you know, the most collected author other than the Buddha. He loved keeping up with John Dewey through his books, and all of these are heavily annotated and underlined. But you know, he didn't own all of Dewey's books. He didn't have access to all of these books. So this is something I encourage uh, you know, scholars when they want to flesh out the relationship between Dewey and Embedkar's, pay particular attention to what parts of Dewey made it into Embedkar's hands or attention span. Not all of them did. Some of them I wish they would have. Uh, for instance, Dewey had some wonderful books on religion, but Embedkar seemed to know nothing about those books from the 1930s. So let's go back to Dewey. If you had to ask me, what does Dewey's philosophy stand for in kind of general uh, you know, themes and parameters? This is how I'd put it. Now, of course, this is me summarizing someone who wrote 8 million words and lived an incredibly long life from 1859 to 1952. 
So, uh, you know, this is a simplification, but for Dewey, obviously democracy matters. When he went to China in 1919 to 1921, uh, he, was, uh, he was called Mr. Mr. Democracy, Mr. Science. So obviously democracy matters for Dewey. Science is a key thing for Dewey, but it's not a God term. Science is just a useful tool that we need to keep extending and keep using as a method of inquiry. Community is vital for Dewey's philosophy, both as an end, a certain kind of community is what you want to achieve, what you want to form, but it also implicates the means. How do we go about creating a group of people that think in a certain way towards each other? We'll see this flow out in a different way in Embedkar's thought, because Embedkar also was invested heavily in community as both an end and as a means. And then also education. Like I said, the Chinese got introduced to Dewey as Mr. Science, Mr. Democracy, but most of Dewey's talks were on education. So, uh, you know, so obviously uh, Dewey you know, is a philosopher of education in the first rank, and a lot of our educational practices in the U.S. now go back to what uh, Dewey was writing around 1900 or 1916. So let's, let's flesh out some of these themes in the personage of Dr. Ambedkar. Uh, but before we get to that, let's let's you know start going into a little more detail on one theme I think is absolutely unique to Dewey, and it becomes central in Embedkar's reception of Dewey and what he does with Dewey, what he adds to Dewey, what he changes in Dewey and pragmatism, right? Because you can be influenced by something by not agreeing with certain parts of it. I like to get this across to my audiences or my fellow scholars who say, "Oh, I'm reducing Embedkar to Dewey." Uh, this is a silly objection, and I don't think that's what this project is about. I mean, what the point is, is that if you are influenced by someone, there are certain things among a bunch of items they proffer that you select and you find useful in a different context, usually, than what Dewey was talking about. And there's some things that strike you as so wrong or so off base that you, you push against them extra hard. You do something a little differently in your own thought because of that part of uh, you know, the influencer's thought. So, so Dewey's influence on Embedkar is obviously very complex. And some of these instances are, are aspects of Dewey that Embedkar likes and wants to extend in the battle against caste. Uh, some of these aspects are things he wants to change from what Dewey said. But one thing that Embedkar seemed to really resonate with in Dewey is the idea that uh, democracy is a way of life. So start with this question, you know, is democracy reducible to decision-making procedures, ways of voting, whether it's among elites in Delhi or in Washington, D.C. or whatever the capital, you know, city is, or is it, uh, you know, citizens that all get to vote every few years? You know, is it that or is it something deeper? So this is a theme throughout Dewey's life that he seems to be fairly consistent on. As early as 1888, when young Dewey was an idealist philosopher teaching at the University of Michigan, you see in one of his early essays, The Ethics of Democracy, an essay, by the way, that uh, we know for a fact Embedkar loved, had, lost, got a copy uh, again from a, a Dalit student in the 1950s and committed parts of it to memory. So Embedkar loved this essay uh, from early Dewey. But in this essay, you see the idealist philosopher John Dewey say, ah, democracy in a world word is a social, that is to say, an ethical conception. Uh, and upon its ethical significance is based its significance as a governmental idea. Democracy is a form of government only because it's a form of moral and spiritual association. So it's more than just a constitution that specifies certain decision-making procedures among the citizens or among leaders. In a book that we know Embedkar possessed since 1917 because he signed it, London, January 1917, Dewey's Democracy and Education from 1916, uh, we see this line. Now you may recognize this line because Embedkar uses this exact line in his 1936 Annihilation of Caste essay. He also uses it again in, a, in the 1950s in a Voice of America radio broadcast. But you know, there in 1916, Dewey said, a democracy is more than a form of government. It is primarily a mode of associated living, of conjoint communicated experience. This line struck Embedkar as deeply profound. Now, of course, Dewey is not spelling out democracy in the context of caste of caste oppression, of social justice and emancipation from millennia old caste oppression. So, so Embedkar takes this little gem in Dewey and then does what he does in India with it and democracy. 
So this wine is wonderful. And you see the underlining I show you here is Embedkar's own. Embedkar owned at least four copies of Democracy in Education. Two of them are heavily annotated. And of those two that are heavily annotated, this line is underlined in both of them. So it obviously struck uh, young Embedkar from his London days on as something worth remembering from his teacher, John Dewey. Now Dewey continues on with this well after he and Embedkar part ways from New York. Uh, in Creative Democracy, a speech that Dewey wrote for a birthday celebration in 1939 that a colleague read, Dewey puts it in slightly different words than what he did in 1916, but he's same idea. Democracy is a way of life. Uh, and only as we realize in thought and act that democracy is a personal way of individual life, that it signifies the possession and continual use of certain attitudes, forming personal character and determining desire and purpose in all the relations of life. So democracy is more than just what you have on a piece of paper like the constitution. It's something that ought to ideally animate how we talk to our neighbors or how we talk to people on social media. This is the current question we have now that Embedkar could not even fathom in his day. So how do we interact with people and what kind of attitudes do we bring towards, uh, you know, the interaction with people of different races, people of different sexes or genders, people of different castes, uh, if you're enmeshed in the caste system? This is the question of democracy. Now let's return to the historical aspect of this inquiry. And we start in 1913 when Embedkar gets off the boat in New York and starts attending Columbia University. So this is where all the stories inevitably bring up John Dewey's influence because this is where the two met. So, uh, you know, the questions I bring to this are, are simple. One, you know, what did Embedkar learn from John Dewey? Now this is fascinating, right? We all recognize Embedkar is incredibly educated, yet no one has much evidence, if any, of what Embedkar heard in any specific class. Uh, you know, now, now, let, now let this sink in for a second, right? What did he hear in all these classes we can see when we look at his transcripts? Usually scholars will say, well, he took a class from this thinker, this thinker wrote this book, so the contents of that book must have been in this class and that must have been what impinged upon young Embedkar. Now this has a lot of inferences to it and sometimes that's the best we can get. What you're going to see in a second is uh, with Dewey, we're able to drill deeper than we've ever gone with any other thinkers influence on Dewey. We can actually access what he heard in these classes in a unique way. The second question that I, I continually have in the background of my mind when I'm looking at the historical aspects of this education is what kind of creative additions did this spur on into Embedkar's thought? Uh, that we can, you know, say he did something different than his teachers, like John Dewey. He did something different from Chinese pragmatists, such as Hu Shu. Uh, you know, so the question you can ask is, what kind of creative additions did he make to a distinctive form of Indian pragmatism? Because this is one of my goals, you see. And Bedkar is more than just an Indian figure. He is a world-class philosopher of his own right. And like any world-class philosopher, he's connected to a tradition of people he agrees with or disagrees with. And I think one of those traditions that Embedkar is in conversation with has to be American pragmatism, especially through the personage of John Dewey. So let's look at Columbia. He spent three years at Columbia. And over those years, he took a lot of courses, something like 50 or 60. Now, three of those courses were from John Dewey. There are two other philosophy courses from a, another uh, thinker, um, William uh, Montague, but he seemed to have dropped those courses. And why? Well, Montague was doing, I think, kind of philosophy and Bedkar didn't like. Montague was also a philosophical opponent of John Dewey. So you kind of see he voted with his feet, so to speak. But he stuck with three courses with John Dewey. Philosophy 231, a course that you, you, we know as psychological ethics, and philosophy 131, 132, a whole year of one course and then another course in the adjoining semesters on moral and political philosophy. We have no evidence that he took or audited Dewey's education class that Dewey was sporadically teaching at that time. And what we have from Democracy in Education, that book he owned, you know, he acquired it in London. We know this because he wrote it inside the cover. So, so it's interesting to think about, you know, what he heard when he was with Dewey personally was not the educational work that influences him in certain ways in the future. Uh, so we can get a richer view of kind of the order of influence with John Dewey. 
So let's let's focus on some themes here and then dive in to the education and the philosophy of John of John Dewey and also of Vim Ram uh, One way to look at this is I think there are at least three key concepts in what we can call Embedkar's pragmatism. Now, these are going to be different concepts than what's in John Dewey's pragmatism. If you were to read all those books, you probably wouldn't come up with these three concepts or themes as leading themes for John Dewey's pragmatism. But for Embedkar, one, caste was important as a habit. Two, force was important but paradoxical. And three, religion became an incredibly important means for Embedkar in a way that it wasn't for John Dewey or even William James. So let's start with the first. Uh, theme one, as I call it here, cast as habit. Now, I've been able to find Dewey's lecture notes and uh, various student notes from the, you know, what I believe is fall 1914. Some of these are actually dated. So, for instance, the bottom of the slide, you see Dewey's lecture notes are actually dated. They're very messy, but they're, they're dated at least. And you start to see what Embedkar was hearing in this class with John Dewey. Now, John Dewey was interested in psychology, so the study of how humans think, but he was also interested, as any philosopher would be, in ethics, how we ought to believe, how we ought to think, how we ought to judge. And so, you know, these two become enmeshed in psychological ethics. The science of the human mind informs, uh, you know, what we expect of our fellow humans and what we ought to do and who we ought to be as a moral agent. So you start to see Embedkar here in the classroom of John Dewey. In this semester, we know he was in that classroom. Uh, the ideas of the place of intelligence and behavior. You know, morals is not just about transcending our physical self or transcending, uh, you know, you know, our, our animal nature. It's about organizing things such as habits and attitudes in a way that's intelligent. It meets the demands of our natural or social environment, and it helps us meet the demands in the next instance. Uh, in that same environment. So, so you see, you know, Embedkar starts to hear in the 1910s, this idea of a very naturalistic view of ethics, ethics that takes human nature and science and biology and Darwin very, very seriously. So habit and attitude, we'll come back to these terms and you'll continue to hear these because I think these are key things for understanding why Embedkar criticizes caste in a very unique way. So look in 1936, in the undelivered, very controversial speech, Annihilation of Caste. Uh, and Bedkar, you know, it's a wonderfully complex document, very long for a speech, but uh, you see, you know, at certain points, Embedkar builds upon this kind of foundation he heard in psychological ethics in fall of 1914 and uses it in a way that Dewey did not use his psychology, that is, as a critique of caste oppression. So for instance, you see Embedkar say, caste is a notion, it is a state of mind. The destruction of caste does not mean destruction of a physical barrier, it means a notional change. It means a change in our concepts or our attitudes to how we cut up the world. What parts of the world have value for us? What parts of the world are repulsive to us? So when you look in that same speech, what Embedkar says is the solution to caste you know, to the, the, how you annihilate this, one of the things he puts a lot of weight upon is a reform in the change in the notions, sentiments, and mental attitudes of the people towards men and things. He says it's common experience that certain names become associated with certain notions and sentiments, which determines a person's attitude towards men and things. And then he goes and refers to very familiar, very long-standing caste or Varna terms that become enmeshed in this graded hierarchy of caste, which of course oppresses uh, each layer below, especially the Dalits, uh, you know, and the so-called un the untouchables in Embedkar's uh, English way of putting it. So, so you start to see that annihilation of caste, Embedkar's not pushing for a legislative solution. He's pushing for a solution that kind of leverages the Deweyan psychology, that so much of our life depends upon the habits we take towards situations, towards people, and that caste implicates habits towards others and also habits towards ourselves. So for instance, in the case of Dalits, and Bedkar seems particularly worried about a certain kind of mental attitude they and caste Hindus have that says that that person is worthless. Okay, so, so self-respect and respect from others go hand in hand in this kind of psychological project of reform. And Bedkar also sees a lot of value in Dewey's notion of reflection or reflective thinking. 
So for instance, in the Annihilation of Thought, and Bedkar pushes this term beyond what, M what Dewey pushes it in the 1908 ethics or in his class context. And, and Bedkar says, reflective thought in the sense of active, persistent, careful consideration of any belief or supposed form or knowledge in the lights of the ground that support it and further conclusions to which it tends is quite rare and arises only in a situation which presents a dilemma, a crisis. Now, those familiar with John Dewey's thought will recognize the notion of a problematic situation here. For Dewey, situations only evoke reflective or higher level conscious thought, science or inquiry, in other words, if they're problematic, if something jars. So what Embedkar is doing here is fascinating. He's trying to create a problematic situation among the high caste reformers who most likely would have heard this speech and trying to get them to reflect upon the value of the Vedas, the value of the Shastras, and whether or not these things need to be followed to the letter, to be uh, burned, uh, you know, they're, they're, he's trying to get them to think about the tradition they have inherited as eternal or sanitan and uh, to reevaluate it in light of the harm it does to folks like Dalits. So, so in other words, he takes Dewey's thought and kind of uses it in a new way in the, uh, the Indian context. Now let's go to theme two. Because throughout Embedkar's life, it seems like he's always concerned with force. This is also a topic in, du in, in Gandhi and in Satyagraha. And you know, what kind of forces are we morally justified in bringing to bear on those that seemingly oppress us or that actually oppress us? So, so this is the idea of force and reform, force and revolution. And this is there in Embedkar. And when you look at the stuff he heard in John Dewey's philosophy 131, 132, year-long sequence of courses, you start to see how Dewey set him up on a certain path and a certain way of interrogating uniquely Indian sources like Gandhi later on in his life. So what does he hear in philosophy 131, 132? Uh, you know, this is a year-long course. Dewey said a lot of things. Again, this is one of the few instances where we can find the notes and I give you the, the, you know, a shot of the notes, you know, how do I know Embedkar was in this class? Well, you look through them and I found Embedkar's name listed as one of the substitute note takers for three of the days. So we know for a fact that this is a very good, we have two sets of notes actually. This, this is a very good re, you know, uh, record of what Embedkar heard in these classes. And some of the days you even see that Embedkar was exactly present writing this stuff down. So uh, what does he hear from Dewey in this year long you know, se sequence of courses? Well, uh, you know, he hears a variety of things and there's so many stories I can tell you about this, but you know, two things jump out for purposes today. One is he hears Dewey enunciate a very important distinction between forces energy and forces violence. I'll come back to that in a second. He also, in April of 1916, hears Dewey talk about the motto of the French Revolution, the idea of the common good, which Dewey says is liberty, equality, and fraternity. So now this is fascinating. This, this triumvirate of values is not a particularly important part of Dewey's philosophy. Dewey mentions it a few times, but Dewey does not use it to organize his ethics, let's say. He doesn't use it to organize his moral critiques of industrial democracy in the US for the large part. Okay, but Embedkar does, right? So this is one of those parts where someone influences in a way that's not mere replication. So uh, you know these three terms if you're from India and you're, or if you're familiar with the Indian constitution because these are in the, the preamble to it, which Dr. Embedkar orchestrated, liberty, equality, and fraternity. Now, if you look at the riddles in democracy from the 1950s, probably 1954, uh, riddle 22 especially, Brahma is not Dharma, you see fascinating kind of epicycles added to this. So remember back to the Deweyan psychology. So much of the battle for ethics and the right kind of communities comes from the right kind of habituation of the social agents within the community. So all the people ideally have the right kind of attitudes towards other members that they're stuck with in physical or in moral proximity. Well, in Riddle 22, uh, Embedkar, uh, you know, he toys with the idea of saying, well, fraternity is an attitude and it's at the basis of democracy. Now he ends up striking that and he ends up going with what you see published in the editions of Riddles in Hinduism, namely the equally powerful idea that fraternity is therefore the root of democracy. In this fascinating text of Riddle 22, you also see Embedkar, you know, he knew a lot. He knew a lot of people. He read a lot of books. Uh, he toys with using Immanuel Kant's wonderful dictum that humans should always be respected and that humans should always be treated as ends, never merely as means. 
So for instance, you see in Bedkar Wright, the first tenet of which is that no person shall treat another solely or even largely as a means, but always as an end. And Bedkar strikes us out, this does not make the published version of Riddle 22. What does? is an indication of his influence at the hands of Dewey. He, he gives a version of the line he saw in Dewey's 1916 class. Democracy is more than a political machine. It's more than a social system. It's an attitude of mind or a philosophy of life. So again, we see kind of the, the trails, the echoes of Dewey in psychology, of Dewey in political philosophy, used in a way that Dewey could have never anticipated. And Bedkar bends and shapes and remakes this philosophy of democracy as a way of life into a harsh critique of the, you know, mil the thousands of year old tradition of Hinduism. So, uh, you know, and we all also are, you know, are probably familiar with these terms as they came up in his famous speech from November 25th, 1949, where he says political democracy, the kind of thing he was creating with his authorship or orchestration of the Constitution of India, won't exist for long unless it's grounded on social democracy. And we start to see uh, Ambedkar connect this, this uh, triumvirate of terms of values, liberty, equality, and fraternity, to the idea of social democracy. So here in this speech, he says, what does social democracy mean? Well, it means a way of life that recognizes liberty, equality, and fraternity as principles of life. And then he goes on to say a variety of things, but mainly that these things are all fairly equal. We'll see this theme come up again. Social democracy only exists when you have all three of these things. And you shouldn't try to get social democracy by denigrating one of these things. So to sum up this part of my presentation, uh, you know, if you were to ask, what is the notion of social democracy in Ambedkar? I'd say it's this kind of constellation of themes or of emphases. Now, again, this is not, you know, if you study Dewey, you won't see these exact things put together in the same way. So this is a unique notion of what our political endeavors push for. So social democracy obviously is defined by those three values, liberty, equality, and fraternity. It also includes both individual focus, you know, the idea of the habits of individual people, how they think about their own self-worth, how they think about the worth of others that might be higher or lower than them in the caste hierarchy. And it also takes into account communities, right? So if you have a variety of people sharing a certain kind of attitude of a graded hierarchy of castes, you're going to get a certain kind of community, a community where this group does not touch or interact or like to walk next to this group. Uh, you're going to get meals structured in certain ways, communal meals structured in certain ways. So, so you get this kind of idea that there's this dialectic between individual habits and attitudes and communities. And that as a good pragmatist, and Bedkar thinks both of these are important. Don't ever just say it's just a matter of systems. Because the individuals are the flesh and blood creatures that make up these systems, that make them continue. And habits are the way they do this. Uh, not just procedures or institutions. Institutions may form our habits. Our habits may form these or inform these institutions. But, uh, you know, it's not just a matter of just making political changes or just, you know, changing bank account totals, for instance. Okay, so it's a matter of how we view each other. And then also reflection, the ability to not just accept the past as what it is. So these things all come together in this constellation that is social democracy and embed car. Now, force, where does force fit into this? Well, it's in a piece that's, I think, just fascinating, but it's often, you know, skipped over in what we talk about when we talk about Baba Sahib, is one of his first publications after he gets done with uh, Columbia University and then his education in London. It's a 1918 book review of Bertrand Russell, a very well-known English philosopher, uh, and it's a review of Russell's 1916 book, Principles of Social Reconstruction. This book is published in 1917. In later notes uh, in 1918, uh, Dewey even pencils this book into his notes. So, I mean, Dewey loved uh, keeping up with Russell. They both kind of hated each other's philosophy, but they respected each other enough to watch what the other one was doing. And it seems like Embedkar, you know, imbibed at the same habit. He liked Russell because Russell pushed forward an idea of reconstruction, value things like growth, but he disagreed with Russell primarily on grounds he got from his teacher, John Dewey. So in this review, you see Embedkar engage a book by Bertrand Russell. Now, what's in this book? Well, what this book is, you know, uh, many chapters and fairly complex, but, you know, what Russell's basic point is, is that humans are driven by impulses 
uh, largely two, uh, you know, acquisitive or creative, and that these cause all kinds of problems. They cause you know, institutions that lead to things like the First World War. Uh, you know, so, so it, Russell is critiquing the human condition, human psychology, and how it re 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 relates to things like violence or things like oppression. And, you know, surely Embedkar saw some valuable things in this book. He chose to review it. So, for instance, one time, at one point in here, Russell says, you know, in any struggle, now this is a version of the Hegelian master-slave dialectic, uh, you know, which also animates Dewey's notion of environments and organisms and their kind of interaction. Uh, but, you know, he sees, and Bedkar sees Russell write these words, each side in a struggle honestly believes that it deserves to triumph. But then when the oppressed win freedom, they are as oppressive as their former masters. So this is this must have struck young Embedkar, who tasted real freedom when he was in New York, and then had to return back to a land that was deeply ingrained with caste bias, prejudice, and oppression. Uh, you know, he, he must have kind of had this as a, a limit. You know, in seeking what I want to seek, my own freedom, could I become as oppressed as those that oppressed me yesterday? Uh, you know, so this is an interesting kind of worry to have, right? Uh, you know, so Embedkar praises this book, but engages it. And it's fascinating. He, he writes a review in an Indian economic journal. So it's largely read by Indian uh, in, intelligentsia or academics. And, you know, but he counsels Indians against seeing Russell as arguing for passivity and quiet, quietism. Russell, of course, was a famous pacifist. And he, he uses a distinction that he heard in Dewey's class on Dewey on force. Uh, that is, force is violence or force is energy. Uh, Russell is totally right. Don't give in to using force as violence. But he thinks, you know, Russell gives up too early on creative uses of force, force is energy. Now, this comes, as I said, from Dewey's lectures in April of 1916, where Dewey, we know this from the, the notes, uh, you know, Dewey said this to the class that the case of force uh, means a distinction, energy and violence, and he defines energy as the ability to do work. Violence connotes destructive value, kind of a use of force that gets something done, but destroys other things that you or others around you might hold as valuable. Now, it's fascinating, too, as an aside, is right in the same lecture, as you see from my slide, Young and Bedkar heard Dewey put this against the Tolstoy uh, kind of position, the, the view that the state and, and force is always awful and always violence. Uh, you know, and, and he pushes against the policy of what he says calls passive inaction. Uh, you know, I'm sure in Bedkar hears here the kind of philosophy that Gandhi was coming to stand for of nonviolence that seemed to many as a little too passive, perhaps, especially in the face of certain kinds of oppression. So, so when Bedkar starts to uh, surely put this talk of Dewey into context uh, that he's worried with, that is of India and caste and how to get the, free of the British, how to get free of the Hindu caste system. He also hears Dewey give a very bad reading of Nirvana or Nirvana, which Dewey glosses as passive introspectivism. Now, you, you surely you hear you know young Embedkar in class pulling his hair out. He loves this Dewey guy so much. Of Dewey's thoughts of democracy resonate with him, yet his, the great Dewey doesn't know that much about Nirvana. But you know that Embedkar never critiqued or abandoned Dewey's thought that was useful to him is a testament to what kind of pluralistic mind Embedkar had. Someone could be wrong or misinformed on. Buddhism and still give you something you can use or retask in terms of democracy. So, uh, you know, from 1918 onwards, uh, the question for Embedkar becomes simple. You know, how do you achieve a political democracy? How do you achieve a social democracy that extends beyond a political democracy while still maintaining and instantiating these values of equality of all people, the freedom of all people, liberty, and fellow feeling? the attitude that each person matters to the others, which is captured in the notion of fraternity. So this is the question from 1918 onwards, and you'll see in a second, this is there in his final years in the 1950s. Now let's talk about theme number three. That is the idea of Buddhism as an intelligent means of democratic reform. So, you know, this is, if you want to talk about Embedkar's pragmatism, you must talk about Buddhism. Uh, you can't simply just end with political notions of democracy or political reforms enshrined in the Constitution. Buddhism is essential to what Embedkar became in his final years. I think it was there all along. 
Uh, but at any rate, Buddhism is essential, and it's, you know, his philosophy worked out in Buddhist terms, the terms that some Buddhists didn't really respect or agree with. Uh, this shows you the kind of pragmatist that Ambedkar was. You don't have to take things, texts, traditions as you found them. You can remake them to suit the needs of yourself and the current situation. So uh, let's talk about Buddhism. Now look at that book, The Buddha and His Dhamma. This is his wonderful magnum opus, uh, his you know, final work in many ways. It was published right after he died in 1957. Uh, you know, he's, he was writing on it furiously from 1950 uh, to 1956 you know, when he died. Uh, he had an early draft that he circulated about 50 copies of called The Buddha and His Gospel. Now in the Buddha and his Dhamma, that's the published final version, you have a whole new section, what he calls a book, book four, uh, that's added that was not there in the 1951 first draft, the Buddha and his Gospel. Now book four is fascinating. Book four includes some of his attacks on communism. We'll return to that in a second. Book four also includes a new section on Ahimsa. Now look at some of these verses from book four, section three on Ahimsa. You know, he wants to say ahimsa is a very important part of Buddhist teachings. This is, uh, you know, this is key. Uh, Buddhism without ahimsa would uh, be like Jainism without ahimsa. You know, it's an important concept that has to be there. Uh, you know, and, and Ambedkar connects this to things like Maitri and Karuna and compassion, fellow feeling. Whether Scott, Buddha's ahimsa, you're there, you're there. We lost you. Okay, excellent. Yeah. Uh, whether Buddha's ahimsa, as Ambedkar says, was absolute or relative, was it a principle or was it a rule? Now, you might have remembered from Annihilation of Caste in 1936, principle and rule appeared in that work as well. Uh, you know, this again is another part of Dewey's thought that Ambedkar takes out of the American context and uses in a way that Dewey could have never saw. So, for instance, uh, if you Go to Siddharth College, you'll find in the special collection of the surviving books from Dr. Ambedkar, two copies of a 1908 text that John Dewey and James Hayden Tufts authored. And this is called Ethics. Now it comes out in a radically revised form in 1932. Ambedkar did not have that 1932 form. So you know, it's again, important to pay attention to what texts he had and when he had them and what in those texts might have influenced him. So in this 1908 text, you see this distinction put in this way and both of the copies of Embedkar's, uh, you know, copies of, of ethics have these both, you know, annotated. Now, if you look closely, you see this distinction that rules are practical, they're habitual ways of doing things, but principles are intellectual. They're useful methods of judging things. So rules are mechanical. They tell you what not to do. Principles are adaptive, but they require you to creatively engage a situation. So in 1936, Ambedkar said he wanted a religion of principle. And Hinduism to him in 1936 was a religion of rules. So in 1957, in the published copy of Buddha and His Dhamma, you see Ambedkar write Buddhism through ahimsa as a principle uh, you know, religion that is a religion of principle. So, so look again in section four, he says, well, what does ahimsa mean? It means love all so that you may not wish to kill any. That's the principle of ahimsa, he says. So it's not simply the high notion of the Jains of do no harm to any living organism, but instead it's this kind of flexible, adaptable principle of how do I engage ever-changing situations, ever-changing political environments. It's the idea that you should try to love all, okay? Uh, so at any rate, you get this at the end of the section as if we didn't get it enough, and Bedkar emphasizes it again. He says, well, to put it differently, the Buddha made a distinction between principle and rule. He did not make ahimsa a matter of rule. He enunciated it as a matter of principle or a way of life. And then he says in a very Deweyan phrase, a principle leaves you freedom to act, a rule doesn't. The rule either breaks you or you break the rule. So rules cannot keep up with the ever-changing nature of reality, social or otherwise. So you start to see Embedkar, through his re-engagement reconstruction with Buddhism, 
uh, he starts to re-envision Buddhism as a principled religion, a religion of principle. And the foremost among these principles becomes ahimsa, the idea that I have a certain attitude towards others that enshrines fraternity. Now, what this means practically is that certain uses of force are precluded. So what you see him do in the 1950s is persuasion is, it becomes the key method of trying to get others to, to see things your way, to create a certain kind of you know, political community the way you think it ought to be created, namely one that gives you respect and gives you freedom and gives you liberty. So uh, you start to see in the 1950s in Bedkar engage rival philosophies, not so much Gandhianism, but he starts to engage other philosophies that are predominant in India and on the world stage. We must never forget the Buddha and his Dhamma is the gospel of Buddha that was authored in English, which is not the primary language of the people oppressed by the caste system. So he saw Buddhism as a, as a global gospel. Uh, and then, you know, in, a, in an important secondary sense, a specific way that he could liberate his people in India. So, uh, so at any rate, in the 1950s, for instance, in this unpublished book manuscript, Buddha or Karl Marx, he starts engaging uh, what he knows and what he thinks about communism and Marxism. And he does this again from the kind of framework that John Dewey gives him as early as 1916. Uh, so he starts putting John Dewey in conversation with the Buddha in his last years. You know, he starts saying both of these believe that the end is always that which justifies the means. You know, and perhaps at the end justified violence and violence would be fine. Uh, but then he quickly goes on to criticize the Marxists that he's familiar with and the prevailing forms of communism he sees in China and Hungary and, uh, and the, you know, in Russia, of course. And he starts to see that they have a predilection towards violence. And this is a use of force as violence. Force is energy is what we need to, you know, as speaking as a good pragmatist, this is the kind of, you know, use of force that we need to emphasize. And, do, and, and Bedkar says in this Buddha or Karl Marx manuscript, the achievement of an end involves the destruction of many other ends, which are integral to the one that is sought to be destroyed. Use of force must be so regulated that it should save as many ends as possible in destroying the evil one. Buddha's ahimsa allowed force as energy. So, so this is fascinating. What you get is this idea that violence may get you something, but what does it cost you? What does it cost you in relationships? What does it cost you in creating new enemies that will resist you all the much harder tomorrow? So this text uh, continues on that, um, or you know, this is actually my words, but the uh, you know the idea what you see here is you know zooming out a little bit is the idea that force needs to be intelligent. It needs to be constructive. It it needs to be adaptive to a present situation. And it also needs to, you know, put, set you up for adapt, adaptation to future situations. Okay, so what Embedkar starts to see is that violence may solve your problems now, but will only embolden your enemies in the future. He says at one point the communists solve their problems by killing their opponents, and maybe that works because they're not around to resist you in the future. But he, you know, he, he thinks it's a very bad way to form community with those you like, those you agree with, and those you dislike, those you disagree with. So in this text, again, you see Embedkar praise things like the Russian Revolution uh, because it aims to produce equality. Uh, but he says it can't be emphasized too much that in producing equality, society cannot afford to sacrifice fraternity or liberty. So you cannot get equality among people by forcing them to not have the same equal status. You cannot get equality among people by doing things that importantly destroy their fraternal attitudes towards you or preclude them having an attitude of fraternity towards you. And Bedkar then says, it seems that the three values can coexist only if one follows the way of the Buddha. Communism can give you one, namely equality, but not all of these, most, specific, most specifically fraternity. So it, again, in this text, he just he makes this clear as day. The Buddha's method was different from those of the communist he's commenting on. The Buddha's method was to change the mind of man, to alter his disposition, uh, such that the person that you're talking to changes to the right way of life voluntarily without the use of force or compulsion. Uh, you know, and how he does this, this is you know, fascinating, but often overlooked. He mentions communicative means. It's through the teachings of the Buddha. Use these things to argue a certain vision of social democracy to those who disagree with you. And then Embedkar says this wonderful line, the Buddha's way was not to force people to do what they did not like to do, although it was good for them. 
His way was to alter the disposition of men such they would do voluntarily what they would not otherwise do. So what you see here in the 1950s is a culmination of all these strands, some of which are unique to India, some of which he saw in, a, in an earlier form in Dewey, the idea that social democracy should animate our endeavors, uh, that force is something we need, but we got to watch out for it being counterproductive or creating oppression in a new way that's just as bad as the old way. So you start to see this come together in Buddhism. You start to see his idea that Buddhism is kind of a framework for how we can engage others honoring the values of equality, liberty, and most difficult of all, fraternity. So in the Buddha and his Dhamma, the published version of the Gospel of Buddha, you see Ambedkar state quite simply that we should cherish no anger, we should forget your enmities, we should win our enemies by love. That's the Buddhist way of life. This is obviously a different path than destroying your enemies or taking away their power to oppress you. Win them by love. Uh, and then he also, at another part of Buddha and his Dhamma, says that the fire of anger should be stilled, even anger that you think is righteously justified. And Medkar does not make a distinction here about righteous and unrighteous anger or justified or unjustified anger. At the end of his life, uh, you know, his idea is fairly clear that Buddhism gives you this framework, uh, you know, of how to, to decrease anger and decrease focus on, you know, desires and the objects of desires that destroy your enemies as well as destroy your own chance at a, kind of a socially just way of engaging each other. Uh, and he says, enemy works e enemy to, excuse me, enemy works evil to enemy, hater to hater, but whose is the evil? Let a man overcome anger by love, let him overcome evil by good. So we get a fascinatingly different view of Embedkar at the end of his life than, you know, his, his fiery political persona early in his life. And like Dewey, he changes. So what, you know, wrapping up, uh, you know, if you ask, what does Buddhism have to do with social democracy? It's simple. Social democracy is about creating a community that's animated by shared interests and individuals that respect each other, that allow each other to achieve their full potential. So in getting that ideal, we have to find a way that does not destroy community and communal bonds to create a community with bonds and no animosity. Okay, so, so the way I read this is that uh, Embedkar is, you know, arguing that we must maintain and nurture the basis of community, even when trying to reform it, and then we have to accept certain limits to will and power. So in other words, I think Embedkar is getting at a very deep point about democracy, whether it's in Dewey's day, whether it's in contemporary, the contemporary United States, whether it's in India of Embedkar's day or contemporary India. I think Embedkar is in some ways a realist about this. We have to try to create the right kind of community <laughs> but we have to know how to lose. Democracy is about knowing how to win. Democracy is also being, uh, you know, accepting uh, that others will win other times. So, you know, and Bedkar has this very complex notion of social democracy that's not merely a political uh, stance. It's an orientation that he grafts onto this reconstruction of Buddhism. So if you ask, what does this kind of pragmatist version of Navayana Buddhism mean in its most broadest strokes, in the most abstract senses. This is what I would start to do to kind of flesh out the 30,000 feet altitude uh, view of Buddhism. One, Buddhism seems to be a socially engaged philosophy. Suffering from bed car becomes things like poverty, but it also becomes things like social disrespect. The disrespect he as a Dalit felt as kind of the target of so many castes that resided above him in this graded hierarchy of caste. Uh, second, you know, this, this Navayana Buddhism is pragmatic insofar as it focuses on the things Dewey thought were the key to democracy, habits or attitudes of self towards your own worth and towards others and what they're worth. His Navayana Buddhism also provides principles that gu guide individual reflective engagement with others in social reform. The key to democracy is not forcing people to do the right thing through coercion. Uh, Dewey and, and Bedkar thought this was a shallow notion of democracy that would never stick. So solving caste can't be done through force, can't be done with a bayonet. It has to be done with, uh, you know, a reformation of the principles of all the people involved. Now, this is difficult. This may not happen in any one person's lifetime, of course. Uh, but this is the ideal that engages us with the present. And ahimsa becomes one of the most primary principles uh, in this engagement. That is a principle of loving others, even those you disagree with, even your enemies. And then finally, fifth, hope must be placed in organizing and persuasion, not in violence or coercion. 
So I'm sure Embedkar saw that in many ways, violence would have been a quicker way to get what he wanted, his, his immediate goals. Uh, you know, many people in India were tempted by violence. A lot of them gave it up for nonviolence, of course. But, you know, Ambedkar wanted to be effective, wanted to be pragmatic in a simple and in a more philosophical sense. Uh, but, you know, you see that Ambedkar was a masterful communicator. He was a barrister and he knew how to argue. His speeches would get thousands upon thousands of people rapidly listening uh, to, you know, his very long addresses. So, so he believed in persuasion. He believed in the power of rhetoric the art of persuasive speaking. And I think this is what he put a lot of his weight on in his final years, even in so far as he rewrote Buddhism to account for winning your enemies over by love and through the preaching of Dhamma. So you get this fascinating view of Ambedkar as a Deweyan pragmatist who like Dewey doesn't believe in violence, doesn't believe in getting shortcuts towards ends that create more problems than they solve. Uh, and that the goal is a certain kind of community, but you also see him wrap Buddhism into this in a way that Dewey would have never anticipated or probably never have accepted given Dewey's very limited view of Buddhism. So that concludes what I have to say today. And hopefully you've kind of seen uh, how, you know, part of this very complex story of Ambedkar and Dewey can be spelled out. And where we go from here is, is what I'm continuing to work on. And I encourage others to look closely at the relationship between Dewey's pragmatism and Bimmer and Bedkar, because I think this is a very profitable and new way to say unique things about a wonderfully complex person that we all know as Baba Sahib. Thank you very much and Jai Beam. Scott, thank you so much for such a wonderful, wonderful presentation. I think uh, listening to your presentation, you know, so many ideas, so many complexities and, you know, so many historical persons, including Dewey, uh, Russell, the Buddha and so on and so forth. It's an incredibly complex uh, sort of a journey, intellectual journey that you have uh, taken us through. And uh, thank you so much for doing it so well in, in such a short period of time. Uh, more than questions, there are a lot of appreciations for what you said. But there are a few questions that we will take uh, Scott at. Scott. One of the questions that has uh, come up is uh, uh, like, one of the questions is uh, 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 like, uh, the question goes like this, that what is the difference between this uh, notion of mind and state of mind? So you refer to caste as a notion of mind. So is there, is, are these two concepts different, like the state of mind and the notion of mind? Yes, I, you know, I don't think uh, there is a big distinction in Dewey between those two things or in Embedkar. Uh, you know, when you look at the lectures in 1914 that Embedkar was sitting in with Dewey, uh, you know, what Dewey talks about is concepts are really just kind of solidified habits very specific habits. Uh, you know, so a concept like dog is going to be pragmatically guiding in how we identify certain furry things, how we pet them or stay away from them. You know, so a, a concept like dog is connected to a label, D-O-G, and this is going to kind of implicate our action paths, you know, how we react to them, how we act with this. So, so this is what, uh, you know, I think Embedkar sees with those caste terms in 1936, Right, is that you got a, a, you know, Brahman, Kshatriya, Shudra, you know, Vaishya. These, these are terms that, uh, you know, are connected to a concept, which is a little broader than the specific way of saying that term in English or Sanskrit. Uh, but all of these things are like what Dewey's talking about, right? They project certain ways of acting or reacting. So whether he calls it a notion or a concept or a habit or an attitude, um, mm -hmm. you know, he's getting the same thing. And, the, you know, an important point to point, to point out here is that you know, for Dewey, humans have impulses and instincts, but, um, you know, th these things get formed into contingent matters, like habits, and we can change these habits. I mean, that's important, hopeful aspect to Embedkar's thought, right, is that caste isn't always the way it is. We can change how we view things. We can get rid of it if it's not useful, and that's the, the tact he thinks we should take. Dr. Scott, uh, there are two questions by one person. Uh, I will sure. read it for you. How do you see the challenge of various associations coming up among Ambedkarites with their differences in interpretations to integrate as community or practice of Ambedkarite and Dewey's thoughts? Yes. 
I, you know, I, it's wonderful. Every time I go to India, I learn about new Ambedkari political organizations or even social organizations, right? This is something in America, our political groups are typically just, you know, trying to get certain people elected. Uh, a lot of the Ambedkari groups in India are the deeper kind of political groups that Dewey would have loved. Groups that are running hostels, groups that are running educational facilities, groups that are running wedding halls for folks that are excluded from other Hindu wedding halls. So, uh, you know, I think there's a lot of hope. One of the challenges is how to get these groups to cooperate. And I'm not an expert on this, but, uh, you know, this is one of those challenges. I know Baba Sahib's legacy has, uh, there's been tensions in it, like, you know, any sustained political, uh, you know, legacy. Another challenge I think that's very much there in India, and it's also here in the U.S., is how do we get along with our enemies? So I feel for a lot of Dalit organizations, they want to push a certain critique of caste and Hinduism. On the other hand, the big goal that Ambedkar saw was all people being Indians first, all people being Indians last. You know, we, we have to find a way to get along even with people we think of as our enemies. So this is a challenge and there's no easy answer to it. So uh, this is one of the things I think all the Dalit Bahojan uh, organizations need to kind of focus on and you know, wrestle with it like anyone even here in the U.S. So Scott, the second question from the same uh, audience is how present day Indian Marxist and right wing groups influenced present day Ambedkarite to integrate, disintegrate into chunks against practicing fraternity as attitude? Yes, so he, it sounds like the, he's asking yes. whether the outer groups are responsible for this fragmentation within. You know, it, it, they could be. I don't. You know, like I said, I'm not. I haven't. I have enough uh, challenge to understand Baba Sahib's uh, thought <laughs> and its influences versus how it's been received. But uh, yeah, you know, a lot of people have argued that um, Ambedkar had a mistaken view of communism or Marxism. Um, you know, th this is fine. I, I like to read those people because I disagree with them, and so it's good to kind of read views that challenge you to make a better argument. And uh, I, I, it might be. Um, but I think, you know, one thing is fairly clear is that Baba Sahib was influenced by Dewey's view of social democracy, and this caused him not to like Marxists that wanted to say, let's take a shortcut to forcing everyone to be the right kind of people, the right kind of community. And he was also influenced by some of his, you know, his economics teachers there, Seligman, as well as Simkovich, to be skeptical on the Marxist claims towards economic determination of history. Um, you know, this is something that I don't think we realize enough, but and Bedkar was very skeptical on views that reduced social strife to one cause or one problem. And he saw the Marxists as doing that. So uh, th that's the best I can offer on that question, but a very important one. Very good. Uh, like there, there is a question, uh, how does Dewey dwell on the informal structures that promote effective or ineffective behavior that make or break democracy? Yeah. I mean, this is a fascinating thing that Dewey's wrestling with in 1914, 1915, even in 1908, the ethics. Uh, you know, institutions, they're related to our habits. They form our habits, right? So in many ways, a government is an expression of the people that put it into place, that wrote the documents, that uh, continue to uphold it. Uh, and in many ways, a certain kind of political institution shapes you know, people's habits because it, it, you know, codifies law, for instance. This is what Ambedkar heard in 1915 and 1916. Uh, you know, Dewey was talking about a philosophy, a philosophy of law there. It's one of the rare spots that Dewey talks about law, but, you know, it, he does it in the presence of Baba Sahib, and, and he says law codifies custom. You know, think of customs as like collective habits. So caste for Ambedkar would be a, a custom that he found particularly pernicious. So what happens is law, in many cases, codifies a kind of custom against murder or against dishonesty in contracts, or in the case of Manu and you know caste-based legislation that gets written down. It's um, you know codifies those co those customs, and so so this is one thing that's fascinating, right? Is that you don't just change individuals, and changing individuals can change institutions. And changing institutions can, in some cases, you know, change individuals' habits. So, so this is the dialectic that's uh, fascinating in Dewey. Dewey's spelling it out with education and politics and democracy, and Bedkar's spelling it out with social life in India and politics. That's a very good distinction that you have brought uh, brought to us. Uh, this is a last question, and then I will have some questions. 
when the question is dr ambedkar said in the buddha and his dhamma about will to kill and need to kill yes and how can we take this into context of ahimsa force as an energy yeah so like need and you know will to kill yeah it's fascinating right because it seems like you know he's he's making a distinction and you have trouble kind of saying well what's he saying can i kill someone can i use violence uh you know it seems like what embedkar is saying can be understood if you think of how pragmatists like dewey were reluctant to agree to any moral you know norm or moral code or moral theory that said this is the answer so for instance emmanuel kant really got under john dewey's skin because kant thought there was a moral law right that was unchanging no matter what culture you're in what time period you're in you know and and again habits and environments and institutions always kind of dialectically react and change and so morals was an ever changing thing for john dewey so so you know you think about like that statement i don't think embedkar is particularly interested in justifying violence i think what he is doing is being a good pragmatist he is concerned with readings of ahimsa or any concept that make it a absolute universal okay because that is trying to capture the impermanent ever changing world into one simple never changing uh you know concept so the world is changing all is impermanent uh you know and here you come along with a theory that says it's all reducible to this okay so i think that's why he was uh you know kind of resisting that view not to motivate you know ways to justify killing but to try to give us something different you know and so that's why he says love as a principle you know notice love can be instantiated in various ways most of the time love doesn't mean killing uh but you know you get to things like uh euthanasia you know a doctor giving a shot at the end of life of someone that doesn't have much time left you know so so you know there might be cases where you say doing something that harms you know fits this principle of love uh so yeah you know and bedkar's clearly not trying to say go out and burn down buildings uh you know i don't think he believed in that kind of radical revolutionary violence uh, you know but but again i think the bigger target is how do we guide our life and its two principles like love beautiful uh scott as i can see from uh, your room you got fascinating photographs of baba saheb ambedkar some of them are very old and very rare so and also a, a few statues of uh, uh, baba saheb ambedkar like uh, through your field work have you been able to uh, uh, you know come across a lot of archives of, related to baba saheb ambedkar Be because i think there is so much historical material that is uh, you know I, i won't say lost but hidden and you are one of the persons who is like uh, uh, an arch archaeologist of uh, baba saheb ambedkar's ideas so uh, you like how do you see the future of this 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 uh, records and you know the scattered uh, uh, hoard here and there yes uh, you know that's one of the challenges you know india you know india better than me but india nothing's easy in india uh, the, you know walking across the street is a challenge and so archives there are like you said spread out and an additional feature is that you know of course embedkar is considered a bodhisattva by many that's why i love that shot i took from uh, mayawati's embedkar memorial park you know the, the plaque in the background you'll see them refer to him as a bodhisattva embedkar so you know he's a religious figure and so many of his books notes letters they're in the hands of private collectors and uh, you know this is fine uh, but they, but you know they they are reticent to give it up to universities but you know maybe someday that'll be the way to do it I think one of the things that's really going to save a lot of these documents because many of them even in the professional archives they're decaying is going to be electronic means and I know University of Mumbai is embarking on a scanning project of some of the papers and letters of Dr. Ambedkar Columbia University and Harvard I believe have some initiatives to scan uh you know issues of janata in coordination with nagpur university so so i think you know the the thing that's going to save a lot of these resources and maybe make them more accessible is the digital revolution uh so hopefully uh, whenever we have a chance and you talk to someone from an indian institution that has access to these things let's encourage them to scan these just to keep them from degrading over the next 50 years so coming to the the process of institutionalization that like you have been making efforts to Uh, promote uh, duyan reading and duyan scholarship in india so can you please tell us more about the center for duyan studies that you and professor khare started in in pune university and what is what, how do you say, uh, envision the future of those centers in india like you want to uh, 
have one center or many centers and you know can the academicians spread across the different universities in india collaborate with you like how does it look like to you yes i mean uh, professor kare and myself in, in embarked on this endeavor and you know like any endeavor in the impermanent world you don't know where it's going but you know i i'd like to think there's going to be more institutions across the uh, you know the scope of india that have dewey centers why because you know, the more we can talk about Embedkar's thought, the more we can talk about Dewey's thought, the more we can talk about democracy uh, to academic audiences or to public audiences, the better. And, you know, Dewey centers, I see them as, you know, based upon the model that they're going to make sure and have accessible to the students, the faculty, maybe even the general public of India, Dewey's works, because it's difficult to get Dewey's works in India. Uh, you know, I, I, many trips ago, I'd give talks on Embedkar and Dewey, and I'd always have students come up to me afterwards, and they'd ask, how can I read Dewey's works? And some are online. And last couple trips, I've taken to the habit of bringing some anthologies of Dewey's works, and I give them out to interested students after my talks. But I said, I got to do more. So, so the Dewey Center really was a very comprehensive attempt to get all of Dewey's published works in uh, hard copy, and then also hopefully an electronic copy there at Pune University and, uh, you know, hopefully around uh, other spots of India. Uh, Shankara starts up various temples all over India to spread Vedanta. Why can't we do this to spread the gospel of Dewey <laughs> and Ambedkar? <laughs> That's very beautiful. Uh, perhaps this is the last question, uh, 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 Scott. Uh, do you see yourself as a bridge between, uh, you know, now the, uh, the, 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 the discourses about democracy in India, in, in USA and in India? Because I think uh, USA being the uh, oldest democracy and India being the largest democracy. And as we know that the democracy is going through crisis in all over the places, a new form of populism is taking control over a lot of uh, societies and communities and the nations. So uh, do you see your role as uh, you know promoting this kind of an information exchange, like what uh, John do you would uh, say social endosmosis, but on a level that is, you know, on a level of, uh, of the world, on the global level, like a lot of people would be interested uh, to know what is happening in, and now, you know, 10 years, 15 years back, there was a blanket uh, over Baba Savambedkar's promotion in, in the world, but now, you know, he's becoming more known and more popular among a lot of people. So do you see your role as a kind of a bridge or kind of a permeable membrane that will promote the kind of a democratic groups in, in the United States interested in the ideas of democracy. So John Dewey, John Dewey is also lost a lot of clout, you know, because not a lot of people are talking about John Dewey. So this reawakening about uh, John Dewey and what Baba Sahib Ambedkar in India, and you know, you are working on both the sides. So how do you, how, how do you see your role in this particular uh, paradigm? Yeah, you know, most likely it's small, like any of our individual roles, but, you know, hopefully it adds up or hopefully it pushes the caravan forward, as Embedkar said. But, I, you know, I see my, my immediate role is to tell a story that someone's got to tell, which is the, in, the historical story of how Dewey's pragmatism connects to Embedkar's thought. The larger view is something that extends to my role as the program director of media ethics for the Center for Media Engagement. This is a wonderful center at my college that's dedicated to finding ways that the news media or media in general, like social media, can be used to not just spread fake news, not just you know make people hate each other, but to inform and create the kind of communities that John Dewey was inspired by. So, so that's the, you know the the large project I see myself as contributing to when I talk about Dewey in India or in Bedkar in the US is this democratic project. How do we get along with those we think are totally benighted? How do we get along with those that hate, maybe even hate us? How do we get along and form community of the deep shared sort of human association that Dewey talked about in the 1910s or 1920s? And you know, this is easier to say than to do because in many ways it involves a choice of loving those who hate you or hating those who hate you and then following these out with communicate, communicative means or, or worse. So, so this is a challenge for India, obviously. This is a challenge for the United States, obviously. I think this is a challenge for any democracy, past or future, which is how do you get along and form this kind of community when human nature always tries to pull you apart or make you think differently? 
So, and you know, and as an aside, Mangesh, I know you and I have talked about this before. I, uh, you know, a personal mission I have is to make sure all my colleagues in the U.S. who often know many things about Marx and know many things about racial oppression, uh, also know something about caste oppression, also know something about Embedkar, uh, because I'm always shocked that so many of my colleagues uh, who don't study Indian matters, they may know a little bit of something about Gandhi, but they've never heard of Baba Sahib. So, so one one important side effect of talking about Dewey and Embedkar is a way to get the Embedkar story beyond those who already know about Embedkar, beyond those who already care about solving caste oppression. So, uh, you know, and Dr. Embedkar's caravan and other kind of online modalities are just another part of this puzzle of how do we get the word out about Baba Sahib's thought. Actually, the last question has come in and, uh, sure. you know, we will dwell upon it for a few minutes. The question sure. is, uh, uh, she's thanking you for your uh, excellent presentation. Her question is, in your focus on ahimsa, love, and persuasion, justice has somehow fallen out of the picture. How would you bring challenge to injustices associated with casteism back into the picture? Yeah, I mean, this is a, this is interesting, right? So, Embedkar in the preamble puts justice alongside the three values, but Embedkar often doesn't talk about justice. Right, you know, in the Riddle Twenty Two, he talks about those three things. In uh, in philosophy of Hinduism, he talks about fraternity, equality, liberty. But justice, you know, often isn't put up there like it is in the preamble. Obviously, justice is important. Obviously, justice and social justice is something that Embedkar is, you know, driven by. So, so my answer to that would have to be one. I think justice in general is in a in a state, you know, very much like Plato. It's a state that that happens once you get the right balancing of these materials. So for instance, in the case of trying to rectify injustice, how do you rectify injustice without creating new injustices? How do you rectify injustice without creating more animosity that will lead to future cases of injustice, perhaps against the caste uh, you know, members or the Dalits pursuing justice? So this is a, this is a complex problem and it's got no simple solution. So, I'm glad they asked that question, um, and I'm sorry I didn't use justice as much in my talk, but it's reflective of something in Embedkar. I think justice is, uh, you know, happens after you take care of equality, liberty, and fraternity. Uh, it's not like it is left out. It is not ignored. It is not devalued, but I think social democracy is a state of justice. Um, that's his beautiful, point. Beautiful, 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 Scott. Uh, your presentation and your question and answer session was so helpful to the audiences. And we would like to invite you again for more elaborate uh, discussions and uh, learn about the Ambedkar Dewey story uh, with the changing information that you dig out all the time. And we are lo very much looking forward to your forthcoming book. And uh, hopefully it will be out soon. Best wishes for your upcoming project. And hope to see you soon in India. Thank you so much for your wonderful, wonderful presentation and the beautiful ideas that you shared with the audiences today. Well, thank, thank you, you. Mangesh. Jai Bhim, my friend. Jai Bhim.